gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so grateful and so thankful for all the blessings that you've given us in Christ. I just ask that you would take and filter out all the foolishness and ignorance, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and we've been going through the epistle to the Colossians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were at verse 11 of chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, verse 11. Just as a reminder, I want to I want to say that the entire context of verses 9 through 14 are centered in the Word itself, the Word of God that we might be filled with the knowledge of His will. We get that from the Word of God. No other place. And the Word of God being the Lord Jesus Christ. He Himself is the Word. He has made unto us wisdom and understanding, and we look down through these verses, and we see that all of these terms are connected with the Word of God, and connected to the person uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to the 12th verse, rejoicing in the marvels of what God has done for us by his grace. In verse 11, we, we see that we are constantly being strengthened. Constantly being strengthened. Did you know that you, you are constantly being strengthened? It's a present passive the passive being that, that is God doing this, we are constantly being strengthened with all power or might according to his glorious power. And I believe in, in the last video, I pointed out that the two words, uh, power and, and might, one is internal power and the other is the manifestation of that eternal uh, or internal power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness and those are two words and we've seen these words before we've seen these these this is hupo mone and macrothumia i pointed out that you know one is a patient endurance and long suffering with uh in regard to uh, or in respect to things that uh, over which we have no control and the other is, is a similar experience with people that we do not essentially control. One is used of God, and the other never is, because there's never any situation in which God doesn't control. There are never any things that God doesn't control. And you'll find that hupomene is a word never used of God. Although he does suffer with people who are not members of his family, he, he actually endures with vessels of wrath fitted for destruction as we saw in the ninth chapter of Romans if you followed along in that series of, of studies of videos the verse ended with joyfulness and the, the problem here folks is that it, you know, it's the easiest thing in the world okay to stand on the wrong side of that verse you know we could spend our time concentrating on the fact that God says these things are true and we ought to have patience and long suffering with joyfulness you know so we'll now concentrate on the joy you know I got to be happy I have to have joy I had someone recently emailed me and it was very heartfelt it was a very uh, almost heartbreaking to me uh, the message that I received from someone who said that they just didn't seem to have that joy, even though they understood that God was working all things together according to their good. And folks, I, I just got to say, you know, uh, it, we can't look at this. We can't be on the wrong side of this verse as if it, the verse is saying that I got to make myself joyful. That's not what the text is saying. And nor is it, uh, is it what leads us into the next several verses. 
there's only one basic underlying conclusion concerning joyfulness. And that is we are joyful because we understand the God who controls our lives. I don't believe the verse is a command to be joyful. You don't see that in the grammar. I believe the verse is a revelation that we are joyful because we understand that it is God who is strengthening us, that it is God's manifested power in our lives. Let's stay within the context here because it's God who's working in us both the will and to do of his good pleasure. And yet what I have said, just said, and, and let me just back up for a moment and say, just as a, another reminder, that I pointed out how the, the, we don't conform our lives to the word. The word itself is what takes and transforms our lives. But what I've just said is not the daily experience of most Christians. Sadly, it's just not. And everybody's Bible has in it the fact that God works all things after the counsel of his own will and that God is working in, in you and me both the will and to do of his good pleasure. And yet the majority of your Christian friends take those verses as though they are true if you're living right, if you're living spiritually. You know, but the way that, you know, you live or the way that they live, they haven't they haven't really quite reached that that plateau of victory yet. So it's not true in their life or maybe you don't feel like it's true in your life. I believe that God is saying to you and to me that you are what you are, you're where you are and you're in the mess that you're in because God's will is to treat you lovingly and kindly. And and purge away the dross that we might be refined in the presence of his glory and his grace. Many a sermon has been preached on the rainbow, uh, but few have ever pointed out the fact that the same God who puts the rainbow there says that when I bring the cloud, you know, we can speak of the cloud of difficulty that, that demands the rainbow, and God doesn't say that he only puts the rainbow there in the midst of difficulty, but he admits that he brought the difficulty. When I bring the cloud, I'll put the rainbow. And the exhortation, the urging of the Holy Spirit is not that I exercise myself unto joyfulness. You know, like you'd go to the gym and just work out. And then, you know, eventually you'll get pumped up and eventually, you know, if you do everything right, you'll just have joy. Folks, that's not how it works. You know, this, well, this isn't really much fun, you know, or whatever, but I ought to be happy. God, I know God wants me to be, so I'll force myself to be happy. I'll force myself to do that. I can walk worthy of the Lord. That is, walk like what I am, or I should say who I am redeemed by the precious blood of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I can do that regardless of the circumstances with joyfulness because I know who made the circumstances. I know who controls the circumstances and I know the one who knows the end from the beginning. That's the basis of the joy which comes from the total conviction that my God is in control. He's never out of control. And he's working in my life and in yours, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. I am more than willing, folks, to admit that, you know, it doesn't always work out the way I want it to or I, the way I think it ought to. But I know that my God is in control. Therefore, I can give thanks. Okay? Giving thanks unto the Father. And once again, I don't see that as an exhortation to give thanks, even though I don't want to. You know, I don't really feel like it, but God wants me to, so I just better. But that thanksgiving and joyfulness are the natural result of understanding who God is. Understanding that strength, that might, that worthiness. 
Dearly beloved, the minute that we take this from the human viewpoint that I'm, I'm going to earn that worthiness by the way that I walk, then I am not looking at his strength, but I'm looking at mine. And I can only be joyful when I assume that I've succeeded, that I've won, you know, and, and I can't be joyful when I know that I've lost, where Thanksgiving has to be based upon when I've been successful and when I've done a good job and we have totally, totally, completely destroyed the wondrous grace of God in this passage. My worthiness, folks, and your worthiness is the worthiness of Christ. I'm exhorted to walk as who I already am. I don't have to earn anything by means of my walk. My walk should simply illustrate what I am. And I realize that that is true because of his might and his strength. And therefore, I can rejoice in the midst of the mess that I'm in. I can rejoice when it is inconceivable to the human mind that I ought to be able to rejoice. If we look at this, folks, in our own strength, our life becomes one continuous defeat or series of defeats after defeats. Dearly beloved, if I realize what God has done for me in the person, in the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, then joyfulness is the natural result and you can see how that that's the power of God in his word that brings about that result. Are, are you following what I'm saying here? And so we can give thanks. Look at the basis, folks, of that thanksgiving. The one who has made me meet. Now, that's an old, that's an old English word. Our, our better English word today, I, I suppose, would be uh, probably would be fit. You know, and in the book of Genesis, we have God making a help meet for Adam. And in many a sermon I've heard, they make it a help mate, you know, somebody to help Adam. But what the text says is that God made a helper fit for Adam. Okay, meet for Adam. And that's what the text says here. Giving thanks unto the Father who has made us what? Made it possible to become fit for the inheritance of the saints in light. Has he done that, folks? Has he done that? Or are we hoping that he'll do that? Oh, God, I just hope he does that. You know, when, you know, when the scales are eventually placed before us and the, and the good is placed on one side and the bad on the other, and we, we stand with, there with bated breath, you know, waiting to see which way the scales will tip. Or is the text saying, Steve, you know, such a, a concept is totally foreign to the Word of God. And, and it and comes out of, of any, any pagan environment that bases its, that it has its theological uh, thesis grounded in or based on, upon our earning merit with God. I don't know how many times you probably, you probably, gotten tired of hearing me say it how the, I, I look at the world religious system today as one in which is which is primarily based on human merit it's a system that's based on human merit folks and that is not the teaching of this book it's not that is not going to bring you joy and peace and thanksgiving okay the text says that God has made us fit for the inheritance of the saints. That's what the text says. The concept will, will be developed further on, you know, until we read the, the climatic statement that we are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. I mean, folks, no wonder I can be joyful. No wonder that we can give thanks in the midst of sin in the midst of suffering, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of defeat. You know, the cloud, not only in the rainbow, but the cloud. And I want you to note that there's not one possible approach to that verse that says, I was made meet because I did something, because I believed, because I received, because I turned over a new leaf. 
But because in the person of his son, he made me fit to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. In light. And the word light there is articulated. In the light. And once again, all of these words refer to the person of Christ and the word of God. So I think that's also true of light or of the light. I am the light of the world, said our Lord. Jehovah was the light in the Old Testament. I don't think it's a, prof, a prophetic uh, eschatological verse, folks. I don't. You know, we want to look, you know, especially at the present time, we want to look at the inheritance of the saints in light as though that's, that's well, that's got to be looking forward to, you know, the rapture or the glories of heaven. And I'm not saying that's probably, you know, that's not included in the thought, but I believe that the Holy Spirit is saying in this context that this is your present condition, or this is your present situation. And I am thrilled that we walk in light. It is the light of the Word of God. It's, it's a light that will become very brilliant once you realize how dark the darkness is that surrounds those who don't know Jesus Christ and who spend no time at all in this in this book the light is more than an, an, an anticipation of heaven folks it is a realization of the fact that we can walk daily in the light of the Word of God okay first John if we walk in the light as he is in the light well surely that's not prophetic that's not looking forward to someday when we'll be in heaven but walking in the light of the Word of God. And once again, it's, it's, it's so easy, folks, to say, you know, that what that means is, you know, you're living a holy and righteous and, and wonderful life. It is not. Walking in the light is not trying to clean up the flesh. It's not trying to clean up the old man. Walking in the light is walking in the truth of God's Word. And if that doesn't bring comfort and joy and thanksgiving, folks, to your life, to your heart. I don't, I don't have some other playbook for you to live by. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a Christian bookstore. You know, full of self-help books on how to live the Christian life. If you'll just do this or that or, or the other thing. You know, it's, it amazes me. You know, there's such a willingness to consume tons of extra biblical material. And yet there's such reluctance to read and study God's word. You know, it's, it's, I just, it's something I just don't understand. Verse 13, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And actually the Greek says in the kingdom of the son of his love. And folks, I, I don't have the ability to explain what I think that verse says. I, I think that we could spend probably the rest of 2019 on the 13th verse. Now, I'm going to suggest once again, I do not take this as prophetic or eschatological. I don't think you're looking forward to someday when you will be delivered, you know, from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. You know, and that's going to occur either at the rapture or at the judgment seat of Christ. When we give an account of the things that we've done upon Christ, you know, they're built upon Christ. I believe that was true with the cross when Jesus Christ died in your place, when he was buried, and when he rose again. We have the exercise of the statement of verse 13. You are not now living in the authority of darkness but you have been translated into the kingdom of the son of his love that is true okay that's true of each and every one of us now that's not a hope for the future that is true now look, look i love you all i truly do i i do appreciate all the comments that you leave on youtube and facebook i'd like for for all of you to take a, at least a, a moment out of your time to take and explore the uh, the social media site parlor.com. I'll put a link in the des description box. 
So I thank you all for your comments. I ask for your continued prayers for this ministry and as well as for my health. Uh, having a few slight difficulties that uh, nothing to be seriously concerned about. But uh, I just want to be able to continue doing what I'm doing with the same strength and the energy that, that I've had before. So until next time, as I said, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in him. Thanks for watching.